Okay. All right. So good evening. Uh, welcome to tonight's program, Queer Newark, an archive of pride. This is one of a series of events the Newark Public Library is planning to mark LGBTQ Pride Month. I am Tom Ankner, director of the Charles F. Cummings New Jersey Information Center at the Newark Public Library. Before we get started, I just wanted to encourage you all to fill out your census forms. Filling out the census is one small but very important thing everyone can do right now to help our city and our communities. If you haven't done so yet, please go to my2020census.gov and fill out the brief questionnaire. The information you provide affects funding for healthcare, transportation, your local schools, and many other needs. Remember, my2020census.gov. It is safe, secure, and confidential. Well, tonight we will be profiling a unique archive here in Newark. Uh, the Queer Newark Oral History Project was created in 2011 at Rutgers Newark. It is a collection of interviews that reflect on the lives of LGBTQ New Newarkers. The project makes these stories accessible to academic and community-based researchers, students, and artists. Sponsors programming that bridges the community and campus, spreads awareness of oral history methods, and commemorates the community's elders. Our guests tonight include Kristen Barr Scorzoni. I, I, how do you pronounce your last name, Corzoni? <laughs> should have asked you ahead of time. I like the flair. It's just Scorzone. But... Scorzone, okay. Uh, our guests tonight include Kristen Barr Scorzone, the volunteer manager of Queer Newark. We are also joined by three people whose memories have been preserved by the project. Noelle Lorraine Williams is an artist and historian, recent graduate of Rutgers Newark, and library assistant at the Newark Public Library. Marina Carrera is a multi multidisciplinary artist with an MFA in creative writing from Rutgers. She is a founding member of Brick City Collective, a multicultural multimedia group of Newark-based artists working for social change, and also works as a poet in the Geraldine R. Dodge Visiting Poets in Schools program. Jay Quinlan is an artist. She is a board member and curator at Art Front Galleries in Newark and a principal of the Artisans Collective on Halsey Street. Welcome to you all. Thank you for taking part in our program tonight. So Kristen, let me begin with you. Uh, can you talk a little bit about why this project was started? What was the initial impetus behind its establishment? Sure. So um, as you said, it was started in 2011. Um, it was founded by, co-founded by Darnell Moore, um, who is an activist um, and a writer. Um, Christina Strasberger, who is the department administrator for um, history and African-American and African studies at Rutgers Newark and historian and Rutgers Newark professor Burl Satter. Um, the three of them came together and then met with the community um, in Newark, the LGBTQ community in 2011. They had like a series of meetings um, over a summer. And I, Jay, were you, you were there for those, right? Yeah, so Jay was a person who was there from the beginning. Um, and what the community wanted was a historical project that collected the voices so that, um, you know, especially like LGBTQ youth in Newark and outside of Newark, but especially in Newark, could um, have access to their own history and not have to like fight for scraps or have this history be erased because we're not recording the voices of the people who are here to tell it while we have them here. And um, so um, once the, the uh, course of the project was chosen, they had a couple of conferences. Um, in 2011, the Queer Newark Our Voices, Our Histories conference took place on campus. And then in 2014, there was a conference called Sanctuary, a history of club uh, spaces in Newark. So it was on like bars and clubs. Um, and um, yeah, and then from there, we started doing a lot of interviews. I became a part of the project, I think in 2015, um, when I was going into my master's degree at Rutgers in history. I'm a PhD student now in American studies. Um, and I got involved because as a queer person, I grew up in Kearney across the river. And I was really hungry for my own queer history locally. And once I started like learning what um you know newark's history was for queer people i was like astounded and just like wanted to keep understanding more because i really thought that you know uh queer history happened in new york city like everybody else thinks or like on tv and film you know and um it happened right here and there was amazing people doing amazing things throughout the decades here um so for me it was just um awesome to get to be a part of that 
So the interview, interview started in 2014 then, is that, is that right? Yeah, roughly, um, because there's like a whole process they have to go through with the IRB, which is a review board that's like institutional. So um, that is like a major hurdle. It's just like a huge application process. So I think, you know, um, they started with the conferences and then um, I think they had some, maybe some interviews done when I joined, but I'm, um, as like me and other grad students were interested, the ball started rolling. And then, you know, when you start interviewing people, then it, that also leads to more interviews because then people are like, oh, you should talk to this person, you should talk to that person, you know, and then it starts snowballing from there. Okay. And how many interviews have been done so far? Do you know? Well, um, I think- Just a rough there's, estimate is fine. I mean, there's on the website right now, I think there's at least 50 or over 50, but in the pipeline, there's a lot more as well because we have a very strict consent process. So like um, we, um, do the audio interview with people and then we send it out to a transcription company. But once we get it back, we vet it to make sure it's accurate. And then we let the person that we interviewed vet it as well to make sure that everything that they want is in there. And, and they didn't say anything that they now maybe regret or perhaps you know they told a sensitive story that they no longer want in there or said someone's name, things like that. We make sure people have utmost control of, of their interview before we put it on the website. How are the um, interview subjects chosen, the people who are interviewed? How are they chosen? Um, it's mainly um, people that are from Newark or of Newark or have contributed to Newark Square History in some significant way. Um, we, um, yeah, and so, you know, we've interviewed people that are like religious leaders in Newark or who have grown up in Newark and maybe have since moved or have taught in Newark or have led a huge, say, like LGBTQ organization in Newark. Um, you know, so it's not like strict in the sense of that you have to be living in Newark right now, right? But so that, you know, in some way from your story, we can glean some of Newark's LGBTQ history for, you know, maybe later historians or students that want to research this or just general people that have interest in the local history and could get something from your story. And um, so when we're doing the interviews, we try to keep it focused on Newark. So like, for instance, we interviewed um, some of the women um, who were a part of a documentary and what happened to them happened in New York City, but they grew up in Newark. So even though this documentary is pretty famous called Out in the Night, we focused on their story of growing up in Newark. You know, like we wanted to hear a little bit of that, but that you could get, you know, like from other interviews with them that are out in the world. But like the Newark specific stuff is our focus. Okay. Um, and your, um, who are the people doing the interviews? Who are, how do you get those people? Um, they're largely um, graduate students at Rutgers Newark. Um, they are historians at Rutgers Newark that are part of the project. So um, our co-director, directors are Whitney Strube and Timothy Stewart Winter. They're both historians and professors at Rutgers Newark. They do many interviews. I, I do interviews. You have to go through um, a training process, um, not only through the IRB, but also, you know, as a team member, like we have regular workshops on how to do oral histories. And um, so we've all been through at least one of them. Um, if not, I've been through multiple now, um, but, um, you know, so it's it's generally students. Um, we've had students that are in the oral history program at Columbia come and, and um, kind of like intern with us um, for a few months and do some interviews, so. But, but mainly graduate students, it sounds like. Yeah. Are, are there other volunteer opportunities for people who are not? Um, yeah. University? Yeah. Yeah, so um, we also welcome community members to volunteer with us um, and you know, um, they are able to vet transcripts and make sure um, that they are properly, you know, transcribed. They're able to help out of, at events or maybe do like photography or um, I used to have people help me a little bit with the social media. Um, yeah, so there's many different opportunities for them as well. Um, and um, we always welcome also like any sort of archival submissions from people. 
I, Christina Strasberger is very helpfully including some links in the chat box of um, one for the main queer Newark site and then also for the site about where you can learn to get involved in the uh, program. So if you, people are interested, you should look at the chat box. Uh, so um, I just, um, so I just wanted, I wanted to talk to the three um, contributors to the archive and just ask you a few questions. And you can, uh, I'll start with you, Marina, um, and I'll ask you all the same questions. So why, why did you want to contribute um, to this archive, Marina? Well, uh, the Queer New York Archive, um, the project itself seemed, you know, extraordinary to me, just the fact that there was something like this happening in, in my native town. I am um, from Newark, born and raised in the Ironbound section, uh, the daughter of Portuguese immigrants. So um, I wondered if there was an, a record of any Portuguese American, or as we're called, Luso American, uh, queer immigrants or queer first generation uh, folks that contributed to the archive. And I'm still not sure, but um, if there wasn't, then I, I wanted to make sure that at least there was one queer Luso American voice that was documented so that you know, second generation, even first, first, second, third, you know, however many generations of Luso Americans um, to come in Newark or in, around Newark or locally could find community or could find their experiences at least reflected in someone. So I thought it was important to, to document my experience really just as a queer Portuguese American first generation person. What about you, Jay? Why did you, why did you want to get involved? Here. I just unmuted you. Thank you, you so go. much. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. So uh, since I since I came to Newark, um, I have found myself like entrenched in almost everything social, communal, um, spiritual. And I immediately connected to many, many things. So as a, a willing participant and a loving participant and just wanting to make sure, you know, as a brown person uh, in the queer network of, of Newark, there's this such deep history, such amazing history and I got to be a part of quite a bit of it. I've been um, in Jersey now for a little over 30 years from New York. I wanted to make sure, like if you don't write down your history, if you don't take care of it, you can't really, you know, allow someone else to be responsible for it. And you can't be ensured that your voice is gonna be recorded. The happenings to you or the things that you um, were influenced by or assisted in being, you know, an influence um, to the community are going to be recorded. So for the most part, um, I was very proud of the things that I was connected to. And I wanted to make sure that I did my part to make sure that those things were recorded, including some of my history prior to getting here. So um, I was very happy to be a part of it. What about you, Noelle? Um, I was happy to be a part of it. I think the person who had suggested I get interviewed was um, Brian Epps from Newark. We had worked briefly together on, what was it called? Newark, Newark Pride Coalition, I'm not sure. Um, and so um, I had heard about it and you know, one of the decisions, the reasons why I decided to do it was kind of like Marina and like um, Jay has said, um, is that I wanted to make sure there was a Black feminist voice from my age group um, that was a part of the interviews of someone who, you know, I was born in downtown Jersey City. Um, I moved to Newark when I was 11, not by myself, with my family. And um, <laughs> we were on the borderline between uh, 16th Avenue and 20th Street. And actually, you know, we used to come to Newark to come shopping at Bamberger's and everything. But just to really like be, make sure that that voice was a part 
of um, the the research, you know, as someone who's from Newark, uh, black feminist, um, from this area, you know, involved in some of the organizing here, as well as the organizing in Brooklyn too. Um, and just to represent in that sense. So what, let's go back to you, Marina. Uh, what was the experience like? And was it different than what you expected when you um, first signed up for it? No, fortunately, uh, Kristen was super welcoming and made me feel really at ease. And um, it was it was really just a conversation that detailed uh, sort of my childhood growing up in the Ironbound and sort of how my art and how my, my poetry connect sort of documents um, or didn't document, right, uh, my own queer histories. Um, it, it, it was, it was more of a conversation. It was, it was kind of just like Kristen asked me, Hey, who are you? And I kind of just talked nonstop for an hour and a half. Um, and, uh, it, it, you know, there were parts, I think I spoke even more than I intended to, I think. Um, but even when, you know, cause Kristen mentioned that they do vet everything after it's transcribed. Um, even after everything was down on paper and I'm like, holy sharing Batman. Um, I was, you know, I was still, I was still very um, sort of um, proud and honored uh, to have, to have this stuff um, be documented. And, and so, you know, I was like, this needs to be, you know, this needs to be um, maybe, maybe these experiences need to be heard or read or understood by someone else. Um, not even necessarily loser American, just, you know, queer feminist first generation. Um, so I, I would say it was just, it was just like talking to a friend. So it was really great. What about you, Jay? What was your experience like? Um, so first I, I, I want to also say that, um, Christina Strasberger and Darnell and Burl definitely had, uh, quite a bit to do. And you too, Kristen, had a lot to do with me, you know, saying, yes, I'll, I'll do it. Um, I appreciate what they do and um, they care very much for the community. So, and, you know, it felt like an honor um, to do. So um, it was a little tedious, <laughs> the process, um, you know, the setup and the get quiet and the get everybody else out so there could be this quiet space. Uh, Marina, I feel like you. I feel like I just overshared, oh, and it was just. Um, <laughs> but but the atmosphere was set that way. You you know it was. I I I wanted to. I wanted to leave a nugget. I wanted to make sure I didn't leave any stone unturned. You know, uh, thinking future thinking that someone might, you know, choose to listen to my archive and may have experienced something that they could never, you know, like flush out with someone else or never believe that someone else had experienced. And to know that, look, it's okay. That happened to you at whatever age, it happened to me too. And look, I'm still here and I'm not just surviving, I'm thriving. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, um, as, as free and open and as inviting as it felt to become a part of it, it also felt like a weight. <laughs> and I mean that like in terms of here you have Marina, Noel, you have an opportunity to, you know, give someone something and, you know, unless it's a feather, you, you, it's, it's going to feel, you're going to feel it. Yeah. You know, so um, I did find myself um, after like reading through the transcript the first couple of times, um, like really being taken aback by the things that I said. <laughs> like, what? I said that, put that in there. Um, same. Um, yet at the same time, so it was like, okay, I carried that weight in there and now I can, I can let it go. Yes. And hope, you know, that it serves somebody. What about you, Noelle? What was your experience like? Well, I mean, I was born in 1975 and I went to college in 1993. And I'm a second wave, almost third wave feminist. 
So basically my whole training in undergraduate was to use your personal experience to like understand the world. So everything was prefaced by a story about how you grew up. <laughs> um, and, you know, and, but even before then, you know, in high school, I started as a cultural activist. So like, even with the student groups, one of the ways like I would facilitate, like say our like women of color group um, is we would, I would like gather folks together and we would look at like Entasake Shange, or we would look at Alice Walker, Audre Lorde, and we would discuss um, their texts. So for me, since like the age of 14, I always thought like cultural activism was important and oral stories are important. So for this, it was more of like, how do I make sure I don't talk them to death and give information and miss them and you know, like miss the mark of what's important, you know? So a lot, I, I thought a lot before um, the interview and about what I wanted to say, but like Jay and Marina said, even though I love sharing, there, there were still some things that I shared that I didn't know I was gonna share. Like, uh, for example, when we moved to Newark and you know, and I saw this father chase his son down the street with an ax. Um, and he was like, you won't be a fag in my house. And just how that like terrified me because everyone on the street was watching and they just like parted and let the father chase after his son. And I think like being 11 and seeing that, it was just like, wow, you know? And I, though I knew I would, I might like share that story, it was still like sharing it again and thinking about being 11 and experiencing that it was it it just brought back a whole bunch of thoughts and feelings yeah i looked through a couple of the interviews and um they're really wide ranging i mean they uh encompass they you know, questions are asked about people's whole lives it's not only about specifically lgbtq parts of people's right. Some people talk about their children, their growing up years, um, their religious beliefs, their religious experiences. Um, so what, um, Kristen, what was the thought behind having that wide a range of interviews? Because there are, I mean, the interviews seem to go for like an hour and a half or two hours, a lot of them, the ones that I've looked at, the, the transcripts that I've looked at. Yeah, I mean, we've had, you know, one interview that that um, span this one man's life that's like six hours long. Um, so if you guys feel like you've talked a lot, I mean, he really, <laughs> and it's great. It's um, really fascinating. And, um, and I just want to speak to a little bit from being on the other side of the table, if I may, is just to say, you know, um, we, I, you know, I'm glad to hear that you felt comfortable, Marina and, and Jay. Um, I didn't do Noel's interview, um, but um, I want people to feel like they're with a friend because it is really personal information. And, and there has been more than one person that has shared something really, you know, um, maybe traumatic or um, just something that they've never spoken about before and are like, you know, you're actually the first person I'm telling this to, you know, uh, but for some reason they feel like it's important to, to get that out there for someone else, like you said, to hear. And as being on the other t side of the table, like I feel like I'm there as like a, a witness to all these stories. And, you know, you have to be sort of um, what they say, like is an, an embodied listener, like one who is really present in the moment and is there, you know, not to judge and not to um, share their own story, but to listen, you know? So if you felt like you were talking a lot, it was really because, you know, I'm glad it felt like a conversation, but we are trained not to talk over you or to make it about us. It is your moment in time. But at the same time, me as a person sitting there, for me, I'm almost like, you know, any listener that, that, that accesses your oral history because I've felt less alone in the world being able to sit down and hear these stories and, and felt really honored to be that person to sit there and hear these stories because there are things that I've gone through in my life that hearing other people's stories I've really resonated with and it's made me feel lighter in my own journey. Um, so I thank you all, you know, for that. And um, 
I think um, the the wide ranging piece, I mean, you know, queer people are not just their, obviously they're not just their gender, they're not just their sexuality and we have full lives and, you know, thinking in, in a historian's way, you know, you wanna know, you know, the trajectory of someone's life because whatever, it may be interesting to someone else for some reason, maybe the way they were went through a, like the healthcare system or maybe the way that they raised their children or the way that, um, you know, they experienced, um, you know, going to church and what that was like. I mean, all of these things are still filtered through the lens of queerness and, um, and or other facets of our identity, whether it's gender or race or uh, sexuality. But, um, you know, it's important, I think, to explore the fullness of people's lives. And as an interviewer, we have like questions that we ask. We have standard queer Newark sets of questions. Um, however, being an embodied listener, sometimes you have to listen and react to the last thing someone said and really follow up on it because you never know you know, sometimes things lead in different directions that are really quite profound to hear about, you know, that you, you maybe, if you just stick to the script and like keep, keep very like, I'm only gonna ask about this or that, um, you're gonna miss those things and it can be really wonderful. So Noelle, you said you thought about what you were going to say going into the interview. Did you have specific ideas you wanted to get across before you actually sat down for an interview? Um, I can't remember now. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I think if there were any, it would probably be about like activism um, and speaking from like a black women's or black girls perspective, you know, just trying to really kind of like make sure that I'm addressing like activism and yeah. And I guess what it means to be like a black feminist woman and here in Newark and Jersey City. Okay. Jay, was there something specific you wanted to get across in the interview before you sat down with the uh, interviewer? Um. I want to say that I had given it some thought or many thoughts that were scattered. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I think that my primary objective at the time, um, in particular because I was working for the Social Justice Center and I had um, a lot of interaction, I've always had a lot of interaction with younger LGBTQ Newark. Um, there were many things going on at the time and we were like up close and personal with it. So my hope was that I could leave a nugget and that I could, you know, maintain being supportive um, objectively. Um, yeah, I think that that primarily was it. And also, I think I was uber conscious at the time um, about what what I said and how I moved because I was very entrenched <laughs> with the church um, <laughs> at the time. <laughs> so, um, but that really all went out the window once I started talking, um, um, you know, because it really is all connected. But I was I was very conscious of it when I first started. I think. <laughs> Uh, yeah. What about you, Marina? Was there was something specific you wanted to get across when you sat down for an interview? Um, I think my intention was to sort of provide visibility, right, for, um, I guess, like I mentioned, Blues American uh, queer people, first generation queer people, um, uh, children of immigrants queer children of immigrants. But I think what ended up happening was there was a visibility that sort of, that happened for me. I was able to sort of step outside myself, especially after reading the transcript and kind of look at my journey and say, you know, oh, oh wow, for a lot of them. Um, but, you know, ju just, just to be able to see my, sort of the milestones that 
you know, I think a lot of queer folks hit that we don't necessarily process until much later in life. Um, so that was rewarding, um, you know, a little scary too, but um, all in all, it was, you know, it was, I think visibility was really the key for, for me, you know, in wanting to provide that and in sort of gaining that for myself. So I wanted to ask about two recent events and get your take on them as new workers uh, in the LGBTQ community. First, COVID-19. Uh, do you think the pandemic has a unique effect on LGBTQ new workers that doesn't have on other people? Um, we can, why don't we begin with you, Jay? Hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah. You caught me off guard right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, a specific effect on the LGBT. Or maybe just talk about your own experience with uh, COVID-19. Um, well, I would, I guess I would venture to have to say yes. And, and I would, I would say it from uh, this particular uh, perspective. Since for many reasons, not of our own making, we're already put in these boxes and separated and, you know, on the margins of you know, take a pick at what you'd like to insert, you know, dash right there. So um, I do think that some people were, were the, the, the isolation may have kept them from receiving treatment. Um, the fear of, you know, being cast aside and not treated properly um, and with dignity, most of all, mm -hmm. and respect, um, definitely had some people that I know uh, not even wanting to access treatment. Um, so, you know, therein lies the conundrum, like, what do you do when you find yourself put in a box and, you know, for lack of a, a better word, some crazy ish pops up and, you know, you find yourself needing something and don't feel safe getting what you need. Um, so, yeah. I think so. Hmm. What about you, Noel? What do you What do you think? I mean, I think in the beginning, since I was having it was the end of my semester, I really didn't um, think so much because I was at home still doing <laughs> twelve hours of work a day. But I think um, one of the things it just made me think a lot about was like outside populations. So um, just thinking of folks who live on the outside and people who still like sex workers who still do sex work, some of which are straight, some of which are LGBTQ. Um, so I thought about that a lot. Um, and I thought about my own relationship, you know, um, my partner is a woman and just thinking about how we relate to each other and we thought more about relationship and I mean it just I think it just gave me the opportunity to think more about various relationships and how we're all positioned um, on the inside or the outside, you know. Okay. What about you, Marina? Do you have anything to add to that? Well, I, I guess just in thinking about what Jay mentioning isolation, I think a lot of queer folks, especially queer New Yorkers, depend on community um, in order to feel connected, in order to feel validated, in order to feel loved um, and accepted. Um, and having those spaces where queer people can safely congregate, right, um, be shut down or taken away, um, I'm sure that that's caused a lot of sort of stress, um, anxiety, um, further, further marginalize them um, in ways that maybe only now we're sort of starting to recognize. I think a lot about undocumented people too in Newark, especially, you know, coming from the, the very immigrant heavy area of Ironbound. Um, if you are already undocumented, um, being, you know, putting yourself at risk in public, um, 
it's the double risk, right? It's the risk of, God forbid, someone of law enforcement catching you or, God forbid, you catching COVID and not being able to get treatment, right, because of your status. Um, it, it's just very terrifying and, and, and putting, you know, and this, I think COVID put a lot of already marginalized people in very dangerous situations. Kristen, do you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, um, you know, I echo with what everybody said here. And I think that, um, I think storytelling, like us recording oral histories going forward, when we, we are going to need to ask about people's experiences with COVID-19 and the coronavirus, you know, the, the, the state response, the government response. And, and I think we'll start to find from people's stories, you know, what sort of patterns emerge or what the unique effects on LGBTQ new workers this had. Um, and, and that in turn, hopefully will, well, I don't know, maybe affect policy or the way people um, treat um, diseases in the future specific to um, queer communities and in and, and ways that give proper aid. But, um, you know, I watched um, the Black Lives Matter march in Newark on Facebook Live when the mayor spoke. And something that struck me that he said is um, Mayor Ross Baraka, he said, um, you know, the black community and Newark is a majority black city is fighting a war, you know, fighting two wars, one um, against the coronavirus and one against racism. Mm -hmm. And especially considering that the black community is one of the hardest disproportionately hit by the coronavirus because of, you know, um, long standing racist, um, in, you know, institutionalized racism with like the housing policy and segregation and, you know, different access to, to employment and whatnot. So like, you know, these are all things that then feed on each other. And then for black queer people, it's it's even more, you know, more intersections of oppression um, may arise. And I think I saw a lot of people comparing it to, to the, you know, the AIDS epidemic and um, in different ways. And um, there are some parallels, however, it's a lot different too, because this is, you know, a global, pandemic that that you know it wasn't stigmatized in the same way because there wasn't this group of people that that only got it of queer people that were then stigmatized but I think again like you all were saying if you are a queer person and you have it and say you're a trans person you know queer trans um african-american person you want to go to the hospital you may not choose not to and and you could get very ill because you're afraid to seek medical treatment because of the ways in which people get treated at doctors when they're not um, straight, white, cisgender, you know, patients. So, you know, and it worried me too when, when they talked about like who gets to live and die because there was so much need for um, access to life support for ventilators and then this ranking of like who gets it, you know, who gets that ventilator. And I was just like, you know, that's terrifying for me as a queer person, I think, you know, that I may be ranked lower than someone that's heteronormative, that has a family, that has this, that, you know, um, they may be like, well, this person's life isn't as valuable. So, you know, I think marginalized people are always a little closer to to systems of death in that way. And um, it's it's just something we need to think about so that we can properly attend to, to needs of the queer community. The other issue, um, Kristen, you brought it up. The other issue I wanted to ask you about is the Black Lives Matter, matter um, I'm sorry, Black Lives Matter movement and the recent, um, the recent demonstrations. Um, have any of you taken part in any demonstrations? Um, and what are your, um, what role do you think LGBTQ Newarkers have in this movement? Uh, Noelle, let's start with you. Um, well, uh, before I respond to that, can I just respond to two things uh, Kristen sure. said? Sure. I just wanted to quickly say, um, yeah, I mean, it, as far as like in, in my period of reflection um, during this whole COVID-19, um, one of the things that came up for me was thinking a lot about the HIV AIDS, um, thinking about HIV AIDS and how our response to it, you know, I was, I was young and a couple of folks that I knew died early on and I just, you know, and thinking about folks who passed away, folks who are who have now been living with it for maybe 30 years, um, and just our different experiences with it. Um, I just, 
you know, like when I'm walking, I'm just like, wow, like imagine if we had like an all hands on deck when HIV AIDS exploded, you know, like, and that to me is just like, you know, when I see people complaining about like the mass and complaining about like gloves and things like that, it makes me think like, wow, like if we had had this kind of response for HIV AIDS, you know, it's just like, you know, it's to me, it's like a, the epitome of um, love in a way for this whole concept of even wearing this mask. And you think of like how with HIV AIDS, we didn't even get to this type of kind of response to it until maybe, I guess, like the late 90s. And that was like 15 years or so in, right? That, I mean, and like I was looking at this timeline of human diseases and it was just, it was just amazing. But, you know, as Kristen was speaking, you know, one of the things I think about is that I'm, I've been out since I was like 15 or 16, but you're right. Like when I go to the doctor, I generally don't wear a pride bracelet. I don't, I don't, I make sure that I look as a kind of like generic black woman <laughs> working generic black woman as possible even though like i will say i'm um i have a girlfriend if we're doing like the chart or whatever and i'm talking to the assistant in the doctor's room huh? but generally my body presentation is to be like clean you know no like mark you know and so it is interesting how it does affect you know we still do have this kind of relationship when we're encountering new um, health practitioners and things like that. Um, and then to respond to the Black Lives Matter uh, protest, I finally went to a protest um, on Sunday, which was the Montclair um, protest. Um, I didn't go to the New York protest. I was really, I, I become ultra paranoid in um, tight crowds. And so um, by the time the Sunday protest came around, even though I've gotten arrested and I've done security for other, <laughs> I've been arrested a couple of times for other protests and I've done security and other type of things to help with protests and I've been a chant leader. For some reason, I was just really paranoid. Um, and so then Sunday, you know, thanks to people like, um, Kristen as my Facebook friend or Christina <laughs> or other people who say it's fine to be in things the way you need to be in them, meaning. So if I needed to, even though I love engaging people, if I have to stand 10 feet from the back of the crowd, that's fine. You know, your presence is still there. And so I like that a lot of liberal activists and queer liberal activists have really been pushing that access to activism in the way you can. And then also I've been donating money too. So Marina, what about you? What do you, what are your feelings on the Black Lives Matter movement and the role of LGBTQ plus uh, New Yorkers? So I went to two marches. I went to, um, on Sunday, we went to both me and my family, which is composed of my partner and our two uh, small children. We went to the one in Elizabeth because that's where my partner grew up. And then we went to the queer Newark, um, Black Trans Lives Matter, Trans Lives Matters um, march that headed into Maplewood, which was um, fantastic. Um, I think the most remarkable part um, is was not only seeing a gathering of all these, um, you know, differently bodied people, sort of different ethnicities, um, really coming together, you know, to support, obviously, um, Breonna Taylor, um, Tony McDade, um, and and sort of all the um, unfortunate targets of, of police brutality and, and, and police murder was um, seeing the children, seeing children march and, and chant Black Lives Matter, um, march and chant, um, you know, no police brutality. Um, I'm a big proponent of educating kids young on racism, and it's by no means easy discussing race with a four-year-old or an eight-year-old, but it's not impossible. Um, and so just knowing that I'm I'm 
we're we're and I say we because there was tons of, of parents and, and, and guardian folks there with children. Um, we're normalizing um, protesting. We're normalizing gathering as a community. I think um, is is a big point in 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 this movement that we're all sort of part of. So Jay, is there something you'd like to talk about this on this topic? Um, I just agree with with everyone. Um, Noel, I really was feeling you there, so I'm sending you a giant hug right now. Um, I think that there are many points in our history that make our heads spin, in particular now, and wondering, like, why the freaking heck did it, did it take this long for things to turn around and for more people to care, for more voices to join, for to even like, I don't even know what to call it right now, except that it looks like we could be going somewhere. That's what I'm gonna say. Um, I did join a protest um, very reluctantly because um, it's not that I'm afraid of crowds, but I just, I, I'm a, a pseudo germaphobe, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Safe yeah. to say, like, I, I want to be here for the long haul and, um, you know, being, you know, quarantined at home, um, I literally and, and lovingly, um, have enjoyed the time that I have been sequestered at home with my wife. Um, we were like in the house for like a month and a half uh, without, you know, really going anywhere, but, you know, to the store or having deliveries or whatever. So, um, you know, to, to be outside and to desperately want to join at my voice my my body my spirit my soul to the action of of protest um so we live in elizabeth and uh we went to the elizabeth march and i was very specific to say okay let the people start walking we stood over here before before everybody left and then when they left i was like okay we, we can leave now and she kept asking me is this far enough way and i'm like yeah you know like i i want to be around but i'm also clear that um, like we do get to access these things in the way that suits our being mm. and also in a way that suits our gifts because mm. not everybody is meant to be walking you know you have an, an incredible artist over here to what's my right Noel has some creations to to birth Marina has has some creations to birth she has some some poetry sessions to um, give voice to, rise to, rage to, and movement to, you know, this movement. I have some art to create. I have lots of things that I want to say and a plethora of platforms in which to um, release them, you know, into, into the universe. So, you know, it, I feel like COVID, Black Lives Matter, racism, colorism, what do you do? And, what all of the isms right now are just like etching at my soul and reminding me that what I have to give is mine to give. And that the job that I have above all things is to figure out what that is and freaking get up on and do it. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all very much for contributing uh, today to this program. We were very glad that you could take part in this. Uh, and we will be recording this and it will be posted on uh, uh, YouTube and Facebook, I believe. So you can watch it uh, later if you want. Um, and uh, I believe the chat will, I think we also record the chat, but I'm not sure how we uh, share that. Uh, anyway, so thank you very much to all of you. and. Um, uh, so, and, uh, and also thank those of you who came in to just view today, for those in the audience who want to know more about the Queer Newark Project, visit the website, queer.newark.rutgers.edu.
You can listen to recordings of interviews and read transcripts. You can also learn about volunteering your own reminiscences or volunteering to be interviewers or transcribers. So thank you, Kristen, Noel, Marina, and Jay for sharing your stories with us. Stay thank safe. Thank you. Good night. Thank Good you. Night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you.